Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the business of cannabis. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg talk with the CEOs, politicians, and cultural icons driving the cannabis industry forward. This is episode 38, where Lewis and Ann speak with Marvin Washington, a former NFL player who dominated on the D-lines of the New York Jets, San Francisco 49ers, and Denver Broncos in the 1990s. Athletes and cannabis seem to go together like peanut butter and jelly. Players in the MLB, NHL, and NBA all pay a daily physical toll for their efforts, but players in the NFL experience a whole different level of pain. Many of these athletes suffer from CTE, a horrible condition caused by taking repeated blows to the head that can lead to dementia and often to suicide. Informal estimates hold that 85% of NBA players use cannabis for either medicinal or adult use purposes, while NFL players are estimated to be closer to 90%. This is all in the face of league policies that prohibit players from consuming, even in states where cannabis is legal. Today, Ann and Lewis are talking with Marvin Washington, a former NFL player who's been on the forefront of the legal cannabis industry for years. Marvin may arguably be the largest player in the cannabis industry. Pun fully intended. Don't sit back, lean forward. Now, on to the conversation with Marvin Washington. Marvin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, wondering, let's just start out with you telling us how you got to be such an advocate for the cannabis industry. What, what brought you to cannabis? Uh, what brought me to cannabis? I was like four and a half years ago, a buddy of mine has a big, uh, golfing event. And I was out there on Friday at the social, uh, reception that, that he gave and, uh, two guys approached me and they were talking about, they had just gotten a patent from the government and they were talking about how it can protect football players' heads and uh, in relationships to concussion. And around this time, you know, the concussion lawsuit had just kicked off. And Junior Seau and Dave Dorison had just killed himself within 18 months. And so that intrigued me. And uh, we set meetings. And uh, from there, um, I did a deep dive and I started to educate myself about it. And uh, I'm, I'm here now, you know, being, being a big time advocate of the plant medicinally and economically and talking about diversity in, in the black and brown community. So can you talk about what is your specific relationship with CBD or THC or what do you what helps you personally? Uh, well, it's CBD, because I don't smoke, uh, you know, on the THC side and in, in not saying that it's anything bad because I got a lot of, you know, former teammates and peers that do medicinally. But my thing is, uh, CBD. And I always tell people that's all for the 10 man for me because it helps with my recovery. It helps with my, um, some of the issues that I have as, as far as with my body, as far as keeping down the, the inflammation and it just creates homeostasis with me, but I'm a whole plant advocate, whether it's THC, CBD, or a combination of both. So what's your um, your general relationship with the industry now? How are you how are you involved? What are you doing beyond the general advocacy? Where where are you making your money? Well, uh, everybody asks me that, and, and I'm with five different companies, either uh, as a board member or, or an investor, or I have a, a great stock position in, in in that company, and that's uh, my income comes comes from that. Uh, and out of the four company, five companies, four of those are, are pretty pretty good winners. One's one's a dog, but we're gonna straighten <laughs> that out next week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> directly, I'm going out to Arizona to straighten that out. But uh, I, I can't can, imagine I, not if you if, if if you don't know how big Marvin is. Six, now, I'm kind six, of scared for Arizona right now. Like, no, we're going like, to handle it legally. We're, we're, gonna, we're not going to go to the streets yet. We're going to handle it legally. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful space to be in, and it changes from day to day and month to month. And it, it looks like it's, it's happening state by state. You know, if, if Oklahoma, you know, voted to, to get medical cannabis, then I think you're going to see all these other states fall, too. Uh, including Utah and Missouri that that are on the ballot this year. So we met you. And, through, we met you through Isodial, 
right? Which is one of the companies right. that you're with. Can you talk right. a little bit about the product suite that you brought to them and, and, and how, how athletes can use that to, to avoid inflammation or anxiety um, and still be compliant? Well, here's the thing that, that the Isodal, they were founded in 2010 and, and they were like a medical CBD company with their tinctures and, and the transdermal patches and things of that nature. I met them three years ago and we did a joint venture to try to have something specific for athletes and people with an active lifestyle. So we created ISO Sport and it's a sports nutritional company, but all of the products are infused with CBD, uh, which is like X as an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant for the brain and any, uh, any, any anxiety. And we have a water, which is great for recovery. It's alkaline aligned. We have a ISO men, which is the pain cream that that's really, you know, that's fast acting, long acting. It, it, it goes right past the blood brain barrier and gets right into the muscle. And we're getting it's, a lot of feedback. Great. With that. I can tell you, yeah. I use it and it's, it's phenomenal. I, I, I use it today. I use it today. Uh, and then we have a drop that there's just CBD dropping. It's just micro. It's not dosing, but it's micro dosing and getting it into your endocannabinoid system every day. Uh, you can add it to uh, your water or, 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 or your, your juice or your smoothie in, in the morning. And then we have these ease pills that are, are, are post-workout. And then we also have a, uh, a, a tincture. And so those are, are all, those are the products that we have in that line and we're adding to them all the time. And we're getting good reception from uh, athletes, former athletes, and anybody with an active lifestyle because it's creating homeostasis and to finish that thought up, there's three uh, tables, three legs on the table of nutrition. There's recovery, which we, we've done that. There's hydration, which, we, which we've done that. And there's nutrition, which we've done that. So we've covered that. And, and that's why ISO Sport is leaving the cannabis B2B and B2C uh, arena. And we're starting to take it out into like the Europas and, and doing football camps and uh, football conferences and basketball leagues and, and things of that nature. So actually, uh, while we're talking about leagues, um, we spoke with Al Harrington a few months ago, and he talked about his conversations with David Stern, the former commissioner of the NBA, um, all of which are online, and they're really interesting. Um, but he kind of got him to come out publicly in favor of allowing players to make use of medical cannabis. And, you know, WADA, the World Anti-Doping Administration, has descheduled CBD for use for international athletes, and the big three just cool. announced that they're allowing for CBD use. So when do you think the NFL is gonna is gonna kind of fall in line with this and get a, a become a little bit more lenient? Lenient? I don't know if that's the right word. No, about, accepting? Well, allowing, accepting? You know, it, 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 I can tell you when they when, when it's gonna happen, but it could happen before that. Uh, it's gonna happen in 2020 when the the collective bargain agreement is up between the NFL and, and the Players Association. I know that this is a priority for the, 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 the Players Association, which represents the body of players, to have a, a sensible medical cannabis program because everybody talks about concussions and, 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 and CTE, but the thing that keeps the NFL and, and the Players Association up at night is the opiate addiction of their former players. And, you know, there's 20,000 former players and we're four times more likely to abuse opiates than uh, general society. So we know what's happened with general society. So imagine what's happened with the former players. But cannabis, uh, whenever it's in introduced into a community, reduces opiate addiction by 15 or 25 percent. What we want to do with the NFL is not eliminate opiates, because if I have a broken leg or a broken arm, I definitely want, you know, some Viking or Percocet or plane block or whatever it is. But over the long term for pain management, then give the guys an alternative that's non-toxic, non-addictive, and it's a natural plant. And so that's what we want the NFL to look at. And I know that in 2020 it's, it's going to happen. But let me say this. If this new form bill is 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 reconciled between the House and the Senate and stays in its current form, stay, stays in its current uh, form, then you're going to have a carve out for CBD and it's going to be taken off the uh, Controlled Substance Act. And then I don't, I don't think the league will have any more excuse not to give their player, players an alternative to opiates and benzodiazepines 
I don't know how they can. They, they give them all can, day. I don't know how they can keep them from using it in the states that it's legal. I mean, if you're in California, it's legal. If you're in New York State, it's legal for medical use. If you're in, you know, you're playing for Buffalo, you're playing for the Jets or the Giants, it's legal for medical use in New Jersey. I don't understand how the league can preempt state law, especially since the athletes are paying state taxes. It just doesn't make sense to me. Well, it's it's in, in, inside the collective bargain agreement that, you know, the, the players and, and the owners agree to that, that the prohibition of, you know, cannabis. But I, I believe that progress is happening because let me say this. When I first got into this industry uh, four and a half years ago, everybody was talking about the, the NFL and it, and it was a matter of of of, uh, of of if the NFL, if if now it's a matter of when. So this thing is going to happen. You know, and they're going to mm -hmm. have to get behind it. And it's happening state by state. And I've always said, and I put something in the Huffington Post, why don't the NFL, you know, do put cannabis under a TUE, which is a therapeutic use exemption, which they give to the guys that have ADD and ADHD that let them take Adderall and all these other uh, performing enhancing drugs underwater. They give these guys an exemption. Why not do it in the states that is recreationally or, or medically legal and put on a doctor's care and give guys cannabis to fight, you know, the aches and bumps and bruises and inf inflammation that they deal with every day? It's it's but, crazy. I mean, I look, I'm I want to keep this. It's similar to the name, but I want to keep it a little light. Um, you know, we don't get to talk to athletes all that often. The last one we talked to was Al Harrington, great guy. Yeah, um, I love Al. I, I love Al. He's he's such a cool. Uh, he's so he's so, you guys. It's every athlete that I meet involved in the space has such a great story and a great reason for being involved. Um, but you know, a lot of athletes don't only use it for pain; they use it because it's fun. There is a there is a fun part of of cannabis. So I grew up a huge Jets fan. I grew up a yep. huge Mets fan. I grew up a huge Rutgers fan. So I only know how to root for teams that lose. And I have afflicted yeah. my kids with this. <laughs> I hear um, you. I hear you. <laughs> man, I'll tell you, though, my favorite story growing up was do about Doc Ellis, who threw a no-hitter while he was tripping on acid. So yeah, you, I heard, played, yeah. you played in the league for a long time. Yep. You ever play against guys who were stoned on the field? Uh, probably all the time. <laughs> you know, and you had one of my uh, the, the, the guys that uh, it came out, uh, Sean Smith, who played in the league for over 10 years and were good friends. And he said he used to smoke two blunts uh, before every game. And that's his pregame pre routine. And I'm sure he wasn't the only one. But I know guys who played, you know, hopped up on uppers, you know, and that was a large percent of the guys. And then I knew guys that you know, used to do a little blow b before the game. And, and that was their deal because the whole thing is, it's like, man, football's a, it's a violent game. And so whatever your pregame routine is, you know, guys are not going to interfere with it as long as it gets you ready to go out there and produce on the field. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've seen guys high play, play on the field. Yeah. Play, play. So how did, you know, Back in when you played, how did players get it? I mean, are, are you allowed to talk about that? Do you, you know, oh, how do you know get, get, get marijuana? Yeah. So like they're going from city to city <laughs> and like, you know, do you have a like a dealer in every port? I don't know how that works. <laughs> I, 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 would, I, would, I would think not. Nah, I had a woman in every port. <laughs> but, nah, I, would, I would think they probably got it from the from the local guys uh, that they, they had it from. And, and traveled you know, with it? Of course, because we were on charter planes, and it wasn't like it, it was today. We it was like you know TSA they, they wasn't checking, and and they still don't check for cannabis. No, they they still don't. You know, yep. and and guys just put on the plane, and and now with all the delivery me methods, guys will be stupid to travel with flour. You know, in 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 my time, yeah, that that's all there was. But now you have vapes, you have edibles, you have uh, oils, you have all types of ways for for delivery. So you don't have to worry about a dog smelling it. But guys will get it the way they've been getting it for the last 60 or 70 years. They get it from their local dealer. When you were playing and you looked at the schedule, um, did you guys ever circle cities like, oh, man, 
we're playing the Raiders. We're going to Oakland. There's going to be the best shit there. Or we're going to Boston. Oh uh, man, I got to bring with that. I, I didn't. I, I, that wasn't my my deal, you know, because that right. wasn't my dr- drug of choice. My my my. If I wanted to get psychotropic, I, I would drink scotch. But saying that, you know, on each NFL team, you know, it, it was just like high school because you had the different groups. You had the stoners, the drinkers, the philanders, the uh, whatever it was. And so I hung out with, with the drinkers, but I was in each group or whatever. But I knew the guys that smoked, you know what I'm saying? And right. guys went and circled the schedule because we had like maybe a third of the team from California. So they would come in during, from the season, you know, at the beginning of training camp. They had enough to last them throughout the season. With the good wow. stuff. Guys from Miami, <laughs> from humble. The guys from Miami came up with something else, and that was like, <laughs> they had the best guy. I'm just telling, like that's the way it was, man. And uh, you know, they say cannabis is not a performing enhancer, but let me say this: like in high school, I smoked it before. You know, I played uh, basketball, and I and I got a college scholarship to go play college basketball. But I smoked it before every game because it, it, it you know, it kind of gave me focus. And it locked me in and I could block out the crowd and whatever. And I could just just focus in. So I can see why guys would do it uh, in college and in the professional, because I believe in that way it's a performing enhancement because it does lock you in. Well, so how do you get around the the tests? I mean, are there are there tests for it? Like, what do you what's I guess or what's the craziest thing that you've ever heard someone does to pass a drug test? In the NFL, it's not a drug test; it's an intelligence test. You pretty <laughs> know when the the test is coming, and that's why I get so mad and, I, and I'm shocked. Like guys, like dude, you know you're gonna get tested in this two week period in July. So during my day, and even now, the off season programs ends at the end of June. Guys would stop smoking probably a week before that train for a couple weeks, three weeks, come to training camp, and they know at any time within two weeks, and it's probably the first week that they were going to get drug tests, offense, defense, or the whole team was going to get drug tests. Once they passed that test, go back to the dorm that night, and it was like 420. And that was the last (laughs) time they were going to get tested for cannabis. So it's an intelligence test. Because if a guy gets caught, like it's like, dude, what are you doing? Well, I mean, Ricky Williams got caught on purpose, right? I mean, when he was playing, he said, I don't give a shit. I'm just going to smoke. Uh, they're, they're, Ricky, Ricky was ahead of his time. You know, and, and you said, like, a lot of guys, you just smoke to have fun and whatever. Yeah, but I, I, I believe those guys are also smoking to relieve some anxiety. I believe those guys are, are smoking to, 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 to go to sleep. I, I believe those guys were smoking to feel better. But Ricky, you know, he was ahead of his time. And he put it on the line and he didn't want to take any opiates or, or benzodiazepines or whatever they were giving him. He wanted to do something natural and he put his career on the line. You know, he, he just came off, of, I believe, an 18, 1900 yard season. He got suspended and people were like, oh, he just wants to smoke. No, he wants he wants to feel good while he's playing football. So how many guys that's been suspended besides Ricky went up to Canada for a hundred thousand, one hundred fifty thousand dollars and played football? Ricky did because Ricky's a football player and that's all he wanted to do. So you're suing Jeff Sessions, which cool. I think probably um, a lot of people are envious of. They say the DLJ. I'm sorry, you're suing the department, our esteemed Department of Justice. Um, and back in February, it's Jeff Sessions. <laughs> a U.S. district judge uh, ruled that the lawsuit um, is must be dismissed because you had failed to use administrative procedures with the DEA, um, right. which I don't fully understand that. Can you give us an update on what's happening with the suit? No, see, the whole thing is, is it was in district court. And so whether we won or lost, we knew we were going to appellate court. We had some made some good points with, with the judge. But the whole thing is is going through the administration process. The average, the average time period from that is is nine to eighteen years, and these kids that have the epileptic strokes and seizures, and these and these veterans that are suffering from PTSD, they need help now. We can't go in and be under administrative procedure with a guy who's a known enemy of cannabis. So that's why we took it to court. 
and feel like we'll we'll get the quickest response from there. So next week we're gonna file our appeal and we'll go from there. But we plan on taking this to the highest court in land if possible because the whole thing is is as this plant has been used for medicines for thousands of years. So either I can trust Mother Nature or I can trust Henry Anslinger or Richard Nixon. And so uh, that's why I joined the lawsuit. And, and, and the other reason I joined the lawsuit, when you go back to the epidemiology of why Richard Nixon put it on Schedule 1 in 1970. He was a racist? He, he was a racist, and he wanted to go after uh, the counterculture people who, who were protesting the, the Vietnam War. And so he went after the, 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 the hippies, and he went after the blacks, and that started in earnest the, the failed war on drugs. So... It's about time that we, you know, we move along because we haven't had a, a, a revolution or counterculture revolution. I know the tech industry and whatever since the 60s. It's about time we had this fight and move this country along and get back to vital based medicine, which is plant based medicine. Because if we keep going down this synthetic opiate route, we're going to lose a generation. We're going to lose a generation. So, you, you know, you, you uh, first of all, amen. Um, Hallelujah. I agree with you. Everything you just said, um, you know, you and I have gotten to know each other a bit over the last couple of months and we've been in meetings with companies and at trade shows and almost exclusively you're the only black fleet black face in the room. Um, it seems like the, the industry has, has gone from being a brown and black industry to almost lily white. So what do you think is going on in terms of diversity and what should be done? No, I, I think, you know, uh, it, people are definitely conscious of it. And, and the whole thing is this, is like you said, when the plant was, was illegal, it was black and brown people that were being locked up and driving the prison industrial uh, complex and, 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 and the war on drugs and the breaking up of families and all this, that, and the other. Now that it's become legal, we don't want, you know, the Caucasians to go to the bank and we're still going to go to jail. We want a level playing field, and I think now states that are starting to implement these cannabis programs, recreational and medically, they're starting to put in a social equity program that 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 deals with you know some of the issues uh, that hurt these black and brown communities through prohibition, like expunging of records, you know, making sure that uh, like New Jersey, if you can own a liquor store in New Jersey, you can own a dispensary. And making sure that 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 it, that it's fair, you know, uh, making sure that it's equi equitable. And there's a certain component when even they, they they get it where they write in the applications that it's weighed heavier if uh, you have a minority or some minority owned uh, applicant that is going for the application. There's also the 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 component where um, a certain amount of the tax dollars have to go back to the communities that were directly affected by it. And so that's happening more and more. And I, and I will say this about the industry is like, I can't get re really mad at <laughs> Oregon or the state of Washington or even Colorado because we not put in a social equity program because minorities are really not there in large numbers, but they're doing it in California. They're doing it in New Jersey. They have to do it in New York. Once that get up, they have to do it in Massachusetts. They're doing it in Florida. You know, where we are, we, we have to be conscious of what happened to our communities and the cannabis community has to address it. That's one part of it. The second part is our community has trepidation over this plant, which they should be. And so there has to be a concerted effort to go out and educate our community about the medicinal and economic benefits of this plant. So you think the the industry has done anything to get into the African American community or the La the Latino community going into churches or just community centers to talk about the change in the na in the nature of the industry or or has they just forgotten about them like no I, 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 think, I, I, I think it needs to be more is done, more needs to be done I know uh, the DPA the Drug Policy Alliance they've been holding events in churches and. Uh, individuals have been doing it and, and women grow have been doing it because the biggest influence in uh, the minority communities throughout, you know, throughout history has been the church. So I've spoken at church and I've spoken with pastors because I'm very comfortable speaking to them about this plant, you know, and, and what it can do. 
I was speaking in Brooklyn about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and I was like, you know, if you worry about regenification, if you get this plant in here and it's equitable and it's fair, you can regenify your own community. But let's talk about the medicinal benefits, you know, and, 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 and especially in the black and brown community with diabetes and high blood pressure and, and, and all these other illnesses, whatever, I believe cannabis can 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 cut down on that and, and not only cure them, but, but cure the nation of this ep uh, opiate epidemic. So this is something that I'm very comfortable with. And that's one of the things that I'm focusing in on is, is faith based initiative to go in and speak before these men of the cloth and, and, and their congregation. I, so when do you think, because I think the, you know, the rescheduling of this, of this drug will, will be, you know, pivotal obviously, but what, what do you think the world will look like six months after it's legal? I mean, I think that a lot of, it seems like a lot of the jurisdictions will have to, you know, go through their court cases and, you know, I would imagine release people who are sitting in jails right now for nonviolent drug offenses. Um, I guess what, what, in general, what do you think the world will look like six months after it's you know what? They're, they're, they're still going to work it out. They're still going to work it out. And I believe if, if it's, you know, if it's rescheduled on the federal level, then the mandate is going to come from, you know, uh, the, the House and the Senate of how we're going to regulate. Because when you look at prohibition ended in 1933, all yes. 50 states have legalized alcohol until 1951. So they're going to work their way through it. You know, they're going to give certain states and some certain states are going to be ahead of the others. But I definitely think if they're going to write it and, 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 and tax it federally, then there should be uh, a social equity part of that. And the people that are in jail for nonviolent uh, drug possession and, and trafficking or whatever, I think they should be I think they should be released, you know, because our prisons are overcrowded with, with people that are in there for nonviolent drug arrest. And I think that's ridiculous. But. History is not going to judge us kind because they're going to look back at it and be like, what the hell? Were you, like, what were you guys doing? You know, when uh, big form and big tobacco and big alcohol gets in here, I'm, I'm fine with it because they're going to bring billions of dollars of R&D to this plant. And then we're really going to see what it can do. And in, you know, the next generation or two generations, they're going to look back at us and say, what the hell? What this plant was here all the time. Right. We're going to look pretty silly. Yeah, we're going no, to we're gonna not look silly. We're going to look like criminals because we put thousands of people in jail and and stigmatized millions of people from using it. And it's it's horrible. I mean, it's it, it's hard to believe. Um, so you are part of a group called Athletes for Care. Um, yeah. Can you talk about what the group is and what they do? Well, Athletes for Care is a, is a group that I kind of co-founded because being in this space, seeing how. It was, and a lot of these companies were using the athletes for their own end and, and their own good, and just using the athletes to drum up interest and get press. And then once they, their, their the, the the tie came in, the athletes both didn't rise. Number one, I want to make sure that the athlete got a fair deal uh, with these companies. So we look over contracts and we advise these athletes, and we always try to make sure that if they're doing appearance for, for, for the company, there's something in for them. If they're going to a conference or an expo, whatever, that they're taking care of at least their flight and their hotel and, and a per dem form, which I didn't get, you know, for the first two and a half, three years that I was in this industry. Also, we want to educate the public because when you look at it, there's only 10 percent of, of, of the population that knows about anything outside of, you know, THC and Cheech and Chong and whatever. But we want to show society, general society, that athletes can and have medicated with this throughout high school and made all types of sacrifices to get a college scholarship, to go to college, handle their classes, graduate, and, and then get drafted in, 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 into the, the highest level that they can play. And they medicate it with cannabis or use cannabis. We want to, like... Everybody says in the stigma. I don't like that. I just want to say I want to normalize it and show that, yeah, you can function. And, and you can, you, 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 the thing that you, you, you were told about, it makes you lethargic and it makes you, you know, uh, sit on the couch and eat cereal all day. That's a lie. You've been lied to, people. No, you have so to stand that, up and that, actually go to the refrigerator to get the milk. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 
That's a bad yeah. joke. <laughs> so um, we, we're telling we're, we're trying to show people that like you know athletes have have used this and and have functioned throughout their whole throughout their whole lives and uh, showing that accountants, doctors, attorneys, lawyer, PR people, wh- whoever it is. <laughs> Yeah. PR people don't PR use people. Marvin. I, I want to drop. Hey, if Lewis can come with a bad joke, so can I. But <laughs> anyway. Nobody can tell as bad a joke as I can. Nobody. Yeah. But that's so, what it's, it's about. It's just showing, you know, society that, you know, athletes have used this and uh, use it and continue to use it. And, you know, th- all these negative things that you thought about, it's, it's not it's not true. We've been lied to. So. We do the same segment every time with every guest. It's called Puff Puff Pass. It's supposed to be like you give us two quick rapid fire things that you really love about the industry and the one thing that you either hate or you fundamentally want to change. Um, and we know that you are not a, a smoker, but you know what? In this one instance, Marvin, you're going to have to Puff Puff Pass. So okay. go ahead. Uh, two things I love about this industry is uh, the energy and, and, and the people that are try, trying to change the, the world. Uh, one thing that I hate about this industry is people want to normalize it and tra- change the negative stigmas and, and connotations. But when you look on their social media page, they're doing these big bong hits. They're doing these dab hits and they're taking these tremendous like uh, blunt hits and these giant blunts. And it's like you're feeding into it. And I hate that. We have you're to talking change. about Pete Sessions, right? <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm talking about the, the people in the cannabis space that are on social media and everybody knows you smoke weed, but you're feeding into it. You know, if somebody's new and want to get in this industry and look at your page, they would think like, like all you do is smoke, which I know you don't. But there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Uh, that's on this on, on that side. And I, as I told you, I love the energy in this and people want to change the world and i believe we can so um i so know your pass, friends pass, pass 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 the duchy to the left hand side <laughs> so i know your friends with um montel um yeah. can you give us a little bit of update on him how is he doing um and if, montel's and if you don't want to Mont- montel's doing fine he had a health issue i believe at the end of june but he's fine and uh he, he's you know He's with his family down down in Tennessee, and uh, you know because the whole thing is it's like Montel probably goes 350 days out of a year promoting this plan and, and dealing with his company and and speaking and what have you, and it kind of wears you out, and you just need to refresh your batteries, and that's what he's doing right now. But but he's gonna come back with a bang. He came out with his uh, CBD line and. Uh, he signed a big distribution deal, and the arrow was pointing up for for Montel and his company. Very cool. Uh, one other question, and then we'll let you go because it just occurred to me: the team doctors are the ones that prescribe ever. In in the legal states, do they nod and wink prescribe cannabis to the players, even though it's against the CBA, and they and the doctors know that it's better for them? than opioids or are they still restricted to only you know benzodiazepine and fentanyl and well, all the it other depend on the shit. state too that the doctors are in yeah i i i think they're pretty much you know uh, tied to what the team wants and the team doesn't want their guys medicating with cannabis and that's the way guys make their their living and 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 that thing i team doctor i put that in air quotes because you can't serve two masters they, right. they're definitely serving the team but I will say this about players, that this is the information age that's at the end of their fingertips, so they know. And there's a, a whole bunch of players that medicate with, with cannabis. Uh, they have cannabis cooks. They get uh, CBD massages. They do uh, infuse yoga uh, or uh, um, the acupuncture with, you know, with, 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 with cannabis and what have you. They're doing it all. And I believe that's the way, wave of the future. Huh. Because, like I said, we, we, we have to get back to that. But I don't blame the team doctors because they've been lied to, like we all have, by this um, by, by the pharmaceutical companies. What percentage of the owners do you think use? Uh, well, I know Bob Ursay does. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you know, you I've, never thought, I, I've never thought about that question. But I, you know, off the top of my head, I'd say it's a small percentage, probably 10%. But I know most of them drink alcohol, like, 
you know, like like Fish. like going out of style. How about the coaches, either their position or head coaches? Are they using or are they just so freaking all they do is stare at film? Nah, they're, they're human. And sports, you know, is a microcosm of society. So if you have a certain percentage of society that's using it, then you're going to have a certain percent of those coaches that are using it too. But they have to keep it real, you know, real close to the vest and, and, and undercover. But right. I have no doubt that, you know, it, 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 it's in the coaching community. How, how are our Jets going to do this year? Uh, I'm optimistic. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, I don't know. I just hope they play hard and, uh, you know, I hope they play hard and they'll have an opportunity to win some games. Oh, that was so politic. Come on. They're like a four win <laughs> team again. It's fucking. Yeah, we're on, a, we're on a public forum. <laughs> well, we can talk about it in private, but. All right. I'm that's fine. That's fine. It's hard. It's hard being a Jet fan. I'm sure it must have been difficult being a player, but I can tell you, your career ends. My pain goes on every day. You know what? Uh, I grew up a Dallas Cowboy, New York Yankee fan, and I had, and that was in the '70s. So I, go Yankees! Yeah, I had some pretty good times with you know the Bronx Zoo and Roger Staubach and Tom Landry and Dorsett and those guys. And I don't know how a parent can make their kid. Into uh, builds character. It builds a character. I guess so. I guess so. I guess so. But uh, and I think the Jets, you know, with a young quarterback, uh, you got to be optimistic. But I hope he doesn't hit the field until at least game twelve or thirteen. If he hits the field I hope at all, he sits this year. Let him. Yeah. Let him be Aaron Rodgers, right? Let him sit for a year or two. I don't care if they win a game. Just don't put him on the field. Let him sit and learn and. They don't have the offensive line to protect him. So, exactly. but this is not a sports talk show. Um, about cannabis, Jet Green. Yes, it is. Green. There you go. All right. So here, here's your last chance. Anything you want to say before we say goodbye? Uh, listen, cannabis is here, man. It's happening. The momentum is is is, is going on. Keep preaching to your friends and family and tell them about this. Uh, don't fall into any stereotypes that you just want to, you know, have fun and get stoned. Tell me you want to feel better. And it's medicinal, uh, at the end of the day and, uh, tell them to tell, tell someone and come out and listen to talks and, and get educated on this plant because it's, 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 it's coming and it's here. Cool. Thanks, Marvin. Thank, Thank you. you, Marvin. Take care. Thanks again to our guest, Marvin Washington. We really encourage you to follow him on Twitter and Instagram at mwash52, which was his number, if you didn't figure that out. Um, and also check out at isodiol, that's I-S-O-D-I-O-L, for some of the products that Marvin mentioned. Um, and full disclosure, isodiol is a client of KCSAs. Um, I have used both their CBD pills and uh, their muscle rub, and they're fantastic. Um, lastly, follow at athletes for care, which is that non-for-profit organization that Marvin discussed um, that's creating a supportive community for athletes after their careers in sports. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, we are starting to build our crowd back up again. It's really appreciated. If you have a comment or a question, we would love to hear from you. Or if there is a guest you'd like us to book, um, you can email us at greenrush at kcsa.com. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at KCSA underscore cannabis. That's one take, Shay. One take. Also, not really, but whatever. We'll stick with it. Good job. <laughs>